You know the story about this young bachar who had reached the age of Shaduchim and naturally the Shatchonim were, were gathering around and trying to snatch up this incredible bachar for the girl of their choice and um, many proposals were made to this young man and uh, he seemed to reject them all. Some he wouldn't meet, some were rejected after one meeting or two meetings and he gave all kinds of reasons. This one wasn't smart enough, this one wasn't pretty enough, and this one wasn't sophisticated enough because he saw himself as being extraordinary and gifted and developed in so many ways that he needed a wife who was worthy of him. And it reached a point where they were simply no more prospective callous, there was no girls. So uh, there was a meeting between the relevant parties, the, the, the Shatchanim and the boys at Rosh Hashiva and parents, and it was decided that this boy needs a lesson in humility. So they proposed to this Bachir that he go off to a special school, a special yeshiva, which teaches Anova how to be humble. The understanding was if the boy will, so to speak, get off his horse, maybe there would be a, a possibility that he'd find favor with some girl. So he went off to the yeshiva Sahanova, and after six months or a year or a year and a half, he, uh, he, he passed the course with honors. He graduated with straight A's. He was now humble. And he came back to his original yeshiva. He sat down in the Beis Medrash, And again, the Shatchanim gathered around him like vultures and they made proposals. And he was a bit surprised by the proposals being offered. He says, I don't understand. This girl I met, and this girl you told me about, and this girl two of you told me about, we already rejected those. I said, yeah, that was a year ago or two years ago. But now that you're humble, we are hoping that you will reconsider those possibilities. So he looks at the Shatkar and says, I don't understand. He says, if a year ago, when I was only a Talmud Chochem and Eved and Lekim and a Yerei Shomayim and a Balmidus Tevis and a Bal Shmua and, oh, and what not, none of these girls were worthy to marry me. Now, on top of all those Milas, I'm humble too. They're certainly unqualified to marry me. The story would be funny if it didn't have any reality, but it does. It does. Now, of course, it goes without saying that somebody whose humility is seen as another stripe or another star isn't humble at all. He's a performer. He's, he's been taught how to go through the motions of humility. Humility is not a behavior. Humility is, humility is a mindset. And clearly, this is not a humble person. They, they, they tell the story about Young Eli sitting in a koil, who during Seder Musr, which they have in many yeshivas, would go into the library, to the other room, they'd face the wall, and they would say repeatedly in a monotone, Ich bin garnished, Ich bin garnished, Ich bin garnished, which means in English, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. This was a, a form of avoid of bit like yesh. It, you know, there have been many, many different movements within Jewish uh, theology and ethics, and this was one of them, to be little self, ich bin garnished, ich bin garnished, ich bin garnished. And this was their pre-minche meditation, as it were, that they would invoke, they would repeatedly say, I am nothing. Well, one fine day, a young boy joined the yeshiva, he was all 14 years old, fresh out of elementary school, and he comes into the yeshiva, and everything is so structured and orderly and predetermined, until he comes to say the Musr, the last half hour before mincha, and now it seems to him to be a free-for-all. Anybody can learn whatever they wish. And he asked his friends what the Seder Musr means. Well, you can do anything. You can learn a Sefer of Hasidus. You can learn a Sefer of Musr. There are all different types of Svarim of Musr, from the Rishonim, from the Achreinim, and more philosophical Sifri Musr, more uh, severe Sifri Musr. Choose. Habayich Yifcher. So he wandered around the base Medish trying to find the path, and he made his way into the library, and behold, he encountered two Kaila Yungalite who had been in this yeshiva for maybe 15 years, who were saying repeatedly this incantation, I am nothing, I am nothing. And for some reason, this, this 
possibility, this option appealed to him. So he aligned himself next to these two Taylor Yung Light and he, he shifted into gear to shuckle exactly as they were shuckling and to figure out the tone. And he joined them in this incantation, in this mantra, I am nothing, I am nothing, I am nothing. And after a while it gets quiet and the two Yung Light and Kailal cease to chant and he, if he's nothing, he doesn't even notice that someone has stopped speaking and he continues doing his chant and he hears one curly young man say to the other curly one, he says, listen, we've been doing this for 15 years and this 14 year old thinks he's nothing. <laughs> Humility and bittel are very, very much a part of the foundation of Hasidus. But they're real, they're deep, they're serious. And there's a presumption that Hasidim are real and deep and serious. And unfortunately, when they're employed inappropriately, when they're misunderstood, when they are made into a ritual, or perhaps one of the most ugly forms of this is when Bittel and Anova means to tell the other person about Bittel and Anova. You know, how do I practice humility by putting everybody else down? Like that well-known little episode with the Rebbe Marash, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, he uh, witnessed his two sons playing. They played all the time. The problem was that the older son was shorter than his younger brother. The younger brother was destined to be the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Shalom Deber. The older son was in his own right, a great Godel and Goen. His name was Rebbe Zalman Aaron. He was two years older than his younger brother, and he was simply shorter than him. So they were playing some kind of a game where the older brother was the Rebbe and the younger brother was the Chassid. So the older brother had them walk on a hill so that his younger brother was lower than him, so that he'd be taller than him. And the Rebbe Marash looks out the window and he sees the two boys playing and how that the older brother is positioning himself so that his younger brother is lower than him so that he appears taller. And he called him. He called him. He summoned the older brother, his older son, Abzalmanan, and he says to him, called him into his office and he told him to get up on a chair. So he got up on the chair and said, Oh, it's Mr. Hecher. Now you're taller. And he explained, You don't become greater by putting other people down. And uh, that, 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 that's a, it's common sense. It's basic. But it's, it can be uh, an important lesson that sometimes needs to be learned and taught and inspired. There are so many stories about humility and what we call in our culture bitlayesh, the breaking of the ego or the transcendence of ego or the getting past one's ego in the tradition of Chassidus, both Chabad Chassidus in particular and Chassidus as a whole. And I want to share a few of those with you now before we actually get to the class and to the Maimir. One of the greatest Hasidim of the Alter Rebbe, one of the greatest, who was very, very loved by the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe, Alter Rebbe is the Balatanya, the founder of the Chabad movement. He, the world calls him the Rav. He favored this particular Chassid. He saw him as very unique, very special, and yet a very, very unusual relationship with him. His name was Repinchas Shik. Shik was his family name. He came from the city of Shklov, who so was also called the Pinchas Shklover, Pinchas of Shklov. And his mother-in-law's name was Reza, Shoshana Rose. Chassidim called him Rapinchas Reizes because she made him into a chassid. She was very, very wealthy and she promised her sons-in-law that if any of them would visit the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman, in Liozne, the founder of Chabad, she would give them a lot of money. So he figured it was worth the try. He could profit a little bit. And um, he became one of the great chassidim of the Alter Rebbe. His father, the Benachshik, was the Av Bezdin of Shklov, was an incredible Gon and an incredible Yerei Shamayim. He was a big misnaget, he was very opposed to Hasidus, but he never uh, sat shiva for his son when he became a Chassid. He wasn't into that angry, you know, violent, hateful streak that existed among some misnagdim. He, he was a misnaget, but he understood that Hasidim are, are from a Yidin. And the Pinchas Reizis was very wealthy, as I just described. And he built himself uh, what we would call today a mansion. 
In those days, the sign of status and wealth was what they called a moyer, a base choyme. It meant an estate, a home, which encompassed a lot of land, that was in a U-shape, that had building on three sides and a gigantic front a lawn and garden and area of recreation and work. And uh, this was a sign of stature. If you were wealthy, you had a, a moyer, as it was called, a base choymer. Um, uh, a sort of a walled-in property. And the Pinchas Reis, unfortunately, was childless. And he built himself this huge uh, base choymer, this huge moyer, this huge dwelling. As an aside, his Rebbe, the Alt Rebbe, asked him once, why do you need such a large home? You have no children, and in general, since when are people supposed to waste uh, you know, precious wealth on materialism? So he said to the Alt Rebbe, the following, he said he was uncomfortable saying I to his Rebbe, so he spoke cryptically. And he said in Yiddish, as Pinchas hata mayer. When as the Shiva Tuva Yiddish Klav Kleibenzach, Kleibenzach by Pinchas. When as the Kleibenzach by Pinchas, had Pinchas had Dayen Shklav. In English, this means to say, if Pinchas, he meant to say, I, if Pinchas has a, a very large house, and the community leaders of Shklav gather, they gather in his house. And if they gather in his house, he can influence the direction of the community. This was what he explained to his Rebbe, why he needed this kind of an estate. There was another Chassad of the Alter Rebbe, who was an Oni Meduka, an incredibly impoverished Chassad, a very great Chassad, and a quite famous Chassad at that, Rabbi Shmuel Munkis. He was a contemporary of the Pinchas, they were the same age, approximately, maybe a bit younger. And he visited Shklov, so he came to Shklov and he went to look up his friend and he comes to this beautiful house, this gigantic home with so many rooms and Shmuel Munkas was used to a shack. And uh, <laughs> he walks into the house and says to the Shmuel's wife, the Pinchas' wife, the Balabasta, is Pinya home, your husband in the house? She says, no, he's away. So he doesn't think too much. He walks right into the house with his big shtivel, his muddy, muddy boots, and the home is decorated with the finest carpets, the finest rugs, and he's just making a mess. He struts through the whole house, goes straight upstairs, and marches into the Pinchas Reis' bedroom and lays down in his bed with his boots on, and he covers himself with the Pinchas Reis' blanket and goes to sleep, and sleeps soundly. The Pinchas comes home and there's a trail. He doesn't, no one has to explain to him. He can follow the trail of mud. So he wakes up his friend and says, Shmuel, I, I, I'm happy you came to see me, but you didn't need to leave a mark all the way to my bedroom. So Shmuel Munka says to Pichas, he says, materialism matters to you. These kinds of things are of concern to you. I want nothing to do with you. When he jumps out of bed and s- storms out of Pichas, he says, his house. And um, Shmuel Munkas was a practical joker, but his jokes always had a, a much greater substance and depth. And he was trying to make a point. And the Pinchas Reises comes after his friend. These were two Yidin who were serious servants of God. Incredibly great Talmud Chachamim, Go'inim. But Oiv the Elikim, these were people who really served God. They, they thought about connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and being pure and transparent in their selves so there'd be room for the Eibishter and their Mitzias. These are serious Hasidim. And uh, when Abshmuel Munkis runs out of the Pinchas Reises' home, it hurt. And he chases him and says, Shmuel, I don't know what I did, but... So Shmuel Munkah says, any chassid for whom materialism matters, I want nothing to do with. He says, I promise you, it doesn't matter to me. It's just this, it, there's no need to waste and to ruin unnecessarily. And Shmuel says, that means it matters to you and I want no part of you. Anyway, a whole negotiation started as a subsequent, as a, as a, as a consequence of this. And the end was, Shmuel Munkah says to his friend, says, I'll make a deal with you. He says, if you take a broom, put it between the legs like a, like a witch, you know, and hop through all the streets in Shklov. I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you, I'll visit your home. Now, Pechaz Reizis was the son of the Avbezdin. He was a big ventator. He was a very respected businessman. And to make, you know, to act like I just put him in a summer afternoon was very, 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 dis, you know, dishonoring. It was not appropriate. But it mattered so much to the Pinchas that the Shmuel should visit him and come to his home that he actually did it. He, he strutted through Shklov with the broom between his legs, you know, demonstrating what you would call in some cultures uh, bitlayesh. There's a story with the Pinchas Reizes and his own father. This same Rapinchas Reizes with his own father, Rapinchas. Rapinchas Shik 
was a very big Talmud Chochem and a big Yiddish Abayim, a God-fearing man. This is a golden age. This is not today. This is 250 or whatever it was, 40 or 30 years ago. It's, it was a golden age of Taira, really. It really, in Lite, until Napoleon, which was the beginning of the 19th century, 1812, it was a golden age of Taira. There was so much Taira, it's, it's indescribable. And the Penech was a gone in that era. And he couldn't understand what there was to Hasidus that one didn't have without it. He couldn't understand why there was a need for a new movement and a new Rebbe, a Baal Shem Tev, who came along and he made a revolution and people are flocking to him. He didn't see what it was about Hasidus that justified its own self-identity or distinct identity. Sifre Musa, Sifre Kabbalah, whatever Hasidus is going to say has already been said and there's no need for this kind of thing. And he was in constant vikuach, he was constantly debating with his son, the Pinchas. And during one of these debates, the Pinchas says to the Pinchas, he says, anything you can learn in Hasidus exists in Sifrei Musar. Any value, any uh, endeavor of self-refinement and purification exists in the books that predate Hasidus. And if you can't find it in the more philosophical Sifrei Musar, you can certainly find it in the more uh, mystical Sifrei Musar, Kabbalistic Sifrei Musar. So Pinchas says, no, no, you need chesidus. So Pinchas says, well, give me an example. So the son says to the father, my example is another humility. That only in chesidus can you be truly humble. So Pinchas says, there's so much on another. In, in all kinds of works of, of ethics and values, both non-mystical as well as mystical works, you don't need chesidus to learn midas anova. So Pinchas says to his father, okay, let's, let's make an experiment. So Rabbi Henech Shik dedicated a period of time to studying and implementing this midah, this, this midah toiv of being humble. And at the end of the endeavor, he told his son, I feel like I have refined myself, not just read texts, but incorporated those ideas into my heart, into my life. I feel like I know what being humble means. The following Friday, Rabbi Pinchas Reis is called aside his father's shamas, and he says to him, my father every week goes to the merchitz, goes to the mikveh, goes to the bathhouse. And you, of course, carry his laundry and his, his soap. This week, tell him, listen, Rebbe, I've been carrying your shmatas for 25 years. Today you carry mine. And somehow he managed to convince the shamas that he, he, would, he wouldn't get fired. You should try it. So sure enough, when the penachshik came out of his cheder, out of his study to go to the merchitz, out of Shabbos, to go to the bathhouse, to the mikveh, before Shabbos, to wash and so forth. He offers his bag of laundries and soaps to his shamas, to his assistant. He says, Rebbe, 25 years I've been serving you. This Friday, you serve me. Of course, the Pedach understood immediately that this was his son's initiative. So he took his shamas' bag, and now the shamas is strutting through the streets of Shlov like a proud peacock, and the Pedach is schlepping behind him. It certainly was not becoming. They went to the Merchitz, and he did his duty dutifully, completely. He helped them with his boots, and those that didn't even have socks, that volicus, you know, volicus meant a long strip of cloth that you would wrap around the leg. It was a whole of science that you would put on socks, and he helped them with the schwitz. I mean, I don't have to go into the details, but it, it was a most humiliating experience. And Abhenek Shik served his servant that Friday afternoon like a loyal, dedicated, experienced chamas. And when he came home from the Merchitz, he summoned his son, the Pinchas, and he says, look, I, I passed the test. I was humiliated in the most extreme ways, but I, I, I was humble enough to do what I needed to do. So the Pinchas raises, says to his father, Father, answer one question for me. What were you thinking as you were experiencing this, this humility? He says, what was I thinking? He said, I was thinking, I was so embarrassed and I was so angry. It, it's a miracle I didn't have a weapon. I was so infuriated at my shamas for embarrassing me like this. So the Pinchas says to his father, had you been a chassid, you wouldn't have felt any shame, any indignity, any anger. It's, a, it's, it's an incredible story. It's, it's a powerful, powerful story because it, we know and we're not Reb Shik, we're tiny little people to start with. How it feels to be embarrassed, especially like the Chazal say, embarrassed by somebody of such a low station, somebody who's not in your world at all. 
and not only to swallow the, the, the indignities, the shame, but to consider it of no consequence. This is, 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 this is a serious, what we call in our culture, avoid the pnimis. This only happens if a person has seriously, seriously uh, refined themselves. And I'll tell you a couple of kutzke uh, just Just for good measure, as it were. You, you've heard of the Mendel Kutzke, the, 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 the Holy Rebbe of Kutzke, the Mendel Kutzke. He was a Hasidic Rebbe. He was a very big tzaddik. I've been told that in some places he's referred to as a sort of Mikotsk, which is a very high level. People of his generation normally don't get that denotation. And a Mendel Kutzke had a following. And the obsession of, of Kutzke was me Samus. Everything has to be Amis, honest. And from the little bit that I've heard and read about Hasidus Kotsk, I would to say this to you, that the ordinary human being who would show up in Kotsk and want to join that group would have a nervous breakdown within 72 hours. The stress, the pressure, the, the lack of, of, of formality and uh, form would have been just too painful to bear. In other words, when you came, you were coming into a world where everybody always said the absolute truth. And to, to hear the absolute truth about yourself, you either better be in pretty good shape or have really, really thick skin. And people who came to Kotsk were no ordinary souls. They were in their own right, Goinim, and in some cases, many cases, big tzaddikim. One of the great... Uh, Episodes of the Reb Mendel Kotzker's unique Rebbeship was the arrival of Reb Shlaime Eger. Reb Shlaime Eger was the grandson of the great Goan Reb Akiva Eger. Reb Akiva Eger was a Goan Noilam, a Gana Goinim, and he was a Tzaddik and a Kodesh. The Middle Rebbe said of Reb Akiva Eger that no one knows his greatness because there is simply nobody to measure him against in his time. It was an incredible, and he was a, he was a he was an Anvis and Kehillel. The Middle Rebbe writes Rabbi Kiva Eger. Such, the Middle Rebbe is the second of the Rebbe. He met Rabbi Kiva Eger in Germany when he visited there in 1825. And he writes such extraordinary things about how humble he is and how scholarly he is and how pious he is. Rabbi Shleimer Eger was such a big misnage that he actually sat shiva when his son, Rabbi Leibel Eger, became a chassid. And there's many stories that are told about Rabbi Leibel Eger's experience in Kotsk. He arrives. And um, there's a, a shtibul, right? he comes to the shtibul, doesn't look exactly very orderly. There's a group of younger lights sitting in the basement, <laughs> having a fabreng, and they're reading shmaltering and saying, L'chaim is singing the gunim. And as soon as he walks in, and he was all bedecked, he looked rabbonish, he looked dignified, and like a rabbi. So someone <laughs> plucked his hat off his head. He was wearing a shtraimel, a beautiful fur hat. And flipped it across the room like a frisbee and announced to the receiver at the other end of the room, sell it and get some money for some bramfen to buy a little vodka so they continue the fabring and say l'chaim. It was very uncomfortable. But the Bible Eger knew what he came to Kotsk for and this is what he wanted. He wanted this Midas Hamas and he was a big enough person to be able to withstand it. There's, 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 there's a hemshech where the father sent a representative to meet his son and to try to talk to him. And he comes to Kotsk and he looks around and he asks, he's looking for uh, the Gon Reb Leibel Eger, the son of the Gon Reb Shleim Eger, the son of the Gan HaGoinim Reish Kol B'nei HaGeyla Reb Akiva Eger. So someone says, ah, do you mean Shleim, you mean Label Shleim Akivas? <laughs> Label Shleim Akivas. There was, there was no formality at all. There was no external respect. But there was an obsession for truth. Now, uh, we can talk on and on, you know, we can, there's so much to say. He, he was very disappointed that they were wasting time and sitting around and he, he complained to them, what are they doing and wasting their time? And, and he, he was introduced to the Mendel Akotsker and he asked them questions and so forth. How do these stories sound to you? Many a person will tell me that I shouldn't share such stories on the internet. How do these stories sound to you? They don't sound pleasant. They don't. They don't sound right. They sound wrong. They sound 
not holy. They don't sound like Hasidus. They sound vicious. They sound mean. They sound self-serving. They sound condescending. In a word, they sound like Midith Royce. No, 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 what's the truth of the matter? The truth of the matter is that there is something called relativity, relativity, relativism. No question about it that if you would walk up to a stranger today and insult him in the street in the name of Bitlayesh, you wouldn't be a chassid, you'd be a bully. And I, if you don't mind me saying it, if you did it a hundred years ago, you would also be a bully. In certain environments, when people are elevated, they're, they're learned, and they're pious, and they're in tune, and they endeavor to grow to a higher level, what someplace else will seem disrespectful, dishonoring, undignified, wrong, is right. It's right in context. In that world, that was appropriate. That was love. It was kindness. It was, it was justice. It was fairness. And if you are familiar with Hasidic culture of the various different types, and particularly Chabad, and you understand or you have been exposed to the Bittal Hayesh center that they have, you know, it's not about you, you know, we're all nothing. You may have experienced an unpleasantness. You may have said, like, this is, this is just rude. This is not religion, this is rudeness. This is... And you know what? In many cases, you would be right. You would be right because when these kinds of things are abused, when they're used incorrectly, it is ugly. It is midas rois. Because Bidl Hayesh, being humble, is actually an extraordinarily high level. It's not simple. You don't become humble because you put your face against the wall at 14 and say, I'm nothing. That's just not the way it happens. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime of effort and introspection and work on self that brings a person to an elevated state. And in an elevated state, you're closer to God and then you're closest to God. That closeness humbles. And that humility expresses itself in being less sensitive. That humility expresses itself in not feeling removed from other people. You know, you could be a big Talmud Chochem, you could be a great Rav, you could be a very big Chassid, and you can sit with a simple person and feel Shava B'Shava. That, that's a high level. It's, it's an incredible achievement. It's not an act. It's not a performance. It's not a show. It's a state of spiritual being that is achieved through much, much hard work. So, it's important for me to, before we get to the Maimon, which is all about humility and joy, to establish this at the outset, that like everything else, life is a journey. Our relationship with God Almighty is a journey. Our relationship with God Almighty, as it's inspired by the teachings of Hasidus, is also a journey. And there's an order. And you can't just jump into the deep water when you don't know how to swim and how to tread water. You just can't do it. There's an order. And the unfortunate fact is that since the Holocaust, there's such a vacuum of hashpah. You know, kids grow up. And they, you know, the, the tradition of the mashpia and the dugma chaye that was in the olden days, it, it's very hard to come by. You don't find a lot of people who are living examples of these kinds of avoida. And you, don't, you certainly don't find a lot of people who are truly living examples of this kind of avoida, who know how to share it, who know how to impart it. The previous Rebbe, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, talks about, in his days, 80 years ago, he talked about what used to be the old chassid. And he says, the old chassid had mesiras nefesh, would make great spiritual sacrifices to help young chassidim learn what chassidus is about. Not just the books and the ideas, but the life and the humility and the, and the, the lack of preoccupation with self, which is, so they had to step out of their own place to share 
And the young Hasidim had to have great Mesiris Nefesh, great dedication to take it in and to learn what it means, you know, it's not fast food. You don't learn about a concept and decide you want to be it. You learn about a concept and then you say, where am I? And oftentimes the answer is, wait, wait, not a day or a week, but a decade or two decades or three decades and so forth. And it's important for me to share with you a maimer in Taira Eir, which I've talked about on a number of occasions in the past, and we may have even learned it, I just don't remember at the moment, where the Rebbe Dalta Rebbe, whose Hasidus we're learning here in the Gutta Taira and Taira Eir, talks about the maimer chazal that a Talmud Chacham needs to have a Shminus, a Shminus, that a scholar must have a little bit of gaiva, a little bit of ego. It's a long maim, it's very involved. But one of the things the Alter Rebbe says there, which is most commonsensical, is that no person begins their pursuit of Torah with humility. No person begins their pursuit of Torah learning Torah Lishma for the sake of God. It's impossible. Everybody must begin their pursuit of Torah with their ego. Everybody must begin their pursuit of Torah, Adai Teda learning Torah, because they want to, because it's, it's rewarding to them. What about the Shmo, and what about Bittel, and what about it's only for God? It's true. Those are ideal truths. But you cannot start off at step 100. You have to start off at step one. Step one means when a boy is a teenager, struggling to understand the piece of Torah, the biggest mitzvah you can do is raise his ego and encourage him and be proud of him and teach him how to be proud of himself. What about Bittal Ayesh? He'll have 80 years to worry about Bittal Ayesh. First be a Yesh, then you'll have what to be Mavatl. This is, this is a real truth that unfortunately by so many is missed. And, and I feel that it, it confuses Bacharim. It, 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 it doesn't allow them to healthily grow up. I was told a story, I'm not going to say any names, but there were two... Hasidim, very big Hasidim, from slightly different backgrounds, living in the same place. And one of these two individuals was sitting with a group of Yeshiva Bachrim, Bachrim, and he was giving them the regular lecture on Bitl Ayesh. You know, we're all nothing and nobody and garbage and no good and, yeah, and so forth. The other Hasid, who was older than him, interjects and says, Listen, I was in Lubavitch. I was in Lubavitch of Lubavitch, the Holy of Holies. And I want you to know that in Lubavitch they didn't put Bachrim down. The Bochum were built up. They were told that they're good and that they're excellent. And as they achieved and they aspired, they were complimented. It was only the older Bochum who were involved in Avodah Pneumius, who we would call Hasidish Bochum, that the, the remedy or the medicine of Bittal Ayesh was applied to. In other words, when a person grows up, there's an order to things. Humility doesn't mean a shattered ego. It means the transcendence of an ego, and it has to be in that order. And when you understand that, you go back to the stories about the Kotzke Rebbe, or about the Pinchas Reuses and his father, and the stories make sense. These stories are reasonable in the context in which those stories occurred. In short, humility and Bittal Ayesh, which are fundamental ideas in Hasidus, are not easy ideas in Hasidus. They're very lofty ideas in Hasidus. And what we'll discover as we learn this maimer, is it not only lofty ideas and uh, a high level of Hasidus, but they really ultimately are very natural. In other words, humility is a very peaceful state. It's not a shattered state. And if humility is a shattered state, then it's this wrong. It's not the right way. Humility is graduating to being at peace with yourself, not resigning of self. And um, I was preparing this mimer this afternoon, and I, of course I was thinking about it, and, and one of the things that crossed my mind as I was preparing the mimer is, what we're learning is that ultimately being a yid is not a sacrifice at all. It's the most wonderful life. It's it's a life that makes great demands, and from a perspective of materialism and ego and, and uh, superficiality and um, you know, immediate gratification and fame makes a lot of sacrifices and demands, but in the end, 
a chassid, a yid who's involved in Yiddishkeit, not just on the outside, but on the inside, is the richest person in the world. I mean, it, truly the richest person in the world. And the humility is, is really a, an incredible level of peace, not sacrifice and shattering of self. And uh, there's so many reasons why this humility is so important. Um, I'm just going to share two more thoughts with you. And uh, then I, I think, <laughs> I've been going on for 35 minutes here. We're supposed to learn a Maimed, the Alter Rebbe, huh? I'll get to the Maimed in a moment. I just want to share two thoughts. From a psychological perspective, humility is the ability to be yourself. It's the ability to identify who you are and to be it without any regard for anybody else. In other words, humility is the ability to not compete. It's the ability to not measure yourself by an external measure, by a societal measure, by a material measure, by a measure that somebody else has prepared, but by yourself. And that, that's very emancipating. Not easy, but very emancipating. And from a spiritual perspective, humility is a window to God. It's a window to God. When we get ourselves out of the way, there's, there's space for the Abishta. It's as simple as that. What I think is important for all of us to understand is how profound it is and how subtle it is, and how much of a journey it is. And the beginning of the journey is being a mensch. And being a mensch means, I'm sorry for lecturing you, watching your time and watching your health and uh, you know, watching your eating and all the rest of the simple things, and then using the koiches, the skills, the possibilities that Abish gave you to the best of your ability to develop your understanding of Torah, to develop a feel for Avodah Yisatfila, to learn how to daven and how to do mitzvahs. And to do that almost untalked about idea of Bidir Amidis, learning how to be a better person, how to be a kinder person, a more forgiving person. These are all preliminary steps. These all come before, you know, exalted ideas like the humility which our mind is here is, is going to be addressing. So uh, I think we can say that I've given you a comprehensive introduction. Huh? So let's go. Um, I'm reading. Uh, line one, it's a short little mime, it's a wonderful little mime, and I must say that uh, I, I'm quite familiar with the mime because this, the ideas of this mime are ideas that the Rebbe so often discussed in the Sikhs, our Rebbe, the, the, the Labavache Rebbe, um, discussed in his talks when he talked about the lessons of Matan Torah and Shavuos to children even and so forth. So here we go. Inyin shanitna Torah al harsin Dafka. What is the significance and the meaning of the fact that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai as opposed to Voloi al Hartover, Vecharmen, Vecharmel? Other mountains which were much taller and much broader and much more massive and so forth. Like it says in the Chazal, Shabo Gamkin, the mountains competed. Sheti Nosin al Torah the Torah should be given on them. And the, the various mountains competed. One said, I'm the tallest, one said, I'm the widest, one said, I'm the most massive. And Hashem chose Har Sinai. And of course the irony of it is, Har Sinai was chosen because it's the smallest of all the mountains, but at the same time, it's a mountain. It says in Targum, The Targum, Yenis and Benazil says, this is just an aside, on Chumash you have Targum Unculus, and then you have the older Targum, Targum Yenison, Targum Yerushalmi. On the VM and Ksuvim, there's no Targum Unculus. There's only Targum Yenis. And Targum Yenison is quite different than Targum Unculus because Yenison ben Azil doesn't translate the words linearly. He often gives whole commentary and says profound insights into the Pesukim. And here's a case in point that the Pasuk is saying, Leis Ravasi, I have no will, Lemitain Oiraisa Al Teraya. To give the Torah on mountains, give sonin that are arrogant, mevasranaya. Mevasranaya means that are haughty, that are substancelessly blown up, so to speak, without any depth. And he brings targum abuzagayene mevasranaya vagefsenay. The the targum of Israel brings what you have in Chazal that Hashem says, I'm not going to give the Torah on the massive. Mountain, which represents, symbolizes, means egocentricity, pompousness, arrogance. Instead, instead, I'm going to give it on Mount Sinai, which is a small little mountain. 
translates the Alter Rebbe in line 4 of Ahainu. She'in yin ha'gavus, the aloofness, the haughtiness, shall tover v'chermein, the various mountains that pre- suggested to God Almighty, Kvayachal. That he give the mountain on them. This is an idea of greatness which is disingenuous, which is false, which is wrong. That they've raised themselves with an arrogance. And arrogance and haughtiness and pompousness. As we know from Kabbalah, that the source of the shattering of the first world of Tayu, of Gil Elakus, was their lack of humility, the lack of compatibility with another Svita, so it shattered. In other words, ego is, 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 is ugly. It's not good. Sometimes egocentric people package themselves well. They, they wrap it nicely so you don't see the egocentricity, but every once in a while it makes it a, an ugly appearance, and it really is. It's disgusting. You know the story, <laughs> the middle Rebbe had a chassid who was a malamid. The middle Rebbe, second Lubavitch Rebbe, had a chassid who was a malamid who was asked to read the Megillah in the presence of the middle Rebbe. So he was reading the Megillah, Megillah Sester, everybody knows the story. And of course, in the middle of the story, you have this moment where Haman comes into Achashverosh, and Achashverosh says to Haman, what do you think I should do to someone that I need to honor? So the Pesach says, Ayyemer Haman, believe a Haman thinks to himself, to whom can the king possibly wish to honor Yosemite many other than myself? So this Chosid read this passage. And he shouted right in the middle of Gilead, Klipa, like ugly. <laughs> when a person's ego shows itself in its shamelessness, it is so shameful. It is so uh, undecoratedly ugly. It's, it's a midara, and it's a source of all evil, because the first thing that ego does is it draws lines between people. It separates people from people. And that brings to jealousy and competition and even to violence. I don't have to tell you. It's not a good midah. And the teda's core is, that man, person, be humble. And acting arrogant is... is is compromising the purity of what the Torah is. Ukmay shekasta b'kam aduchti, as discussed so often in in the writings of the Alter Rebbe, the author of this Maimon. Skip the small type. Zeh Shamra, as the Gemara says, im meisim adam atzmei kemidbar. If a person makes himself as a desert, shakel doshen be, they all trample upon it. Then they're going to be zoyche to the Torah. Then they'll merit to have Torah. This is brought in Gemara and in Rambam in Halacha that the Torah was given in a desert. And there are various reasons why. One of them is because the desert has no owner, and the Torah has no owner. Anybody who wishes can have it. Munachas Paket and Zavis, Kol Mishraitz a little of Yitl. The Torah doesn't have an owner. Anybody who wants it can have it. Additionally, the desert shows on this humility. Opir, as Rashi Rashi interprets, Shein Legasus, that one who does not have arrogance, Torah nit leib matana, Torah is given to him as a gift. There is space for the Torah in this person. Okamayim, like we say in the Siddur, in the end of the Shemayna Esrei. My soul should be like dust in my relationships with my fellow. And then and only then, open up my heart for your Teira. The idea, of course, is that humility is the prerequisite to Teira. Therefore, the Teira was given on Mount Sinai, the Mochich, because it's the lowest of all the mountains. Shu'in in Ashivas, which is the idea of humility. Sha'inim Agbiya Satsavakhulu. It doesn't raise itself, it's not full of itself, it's not preoccupied with itself, which represents the theme of humility, which is necessary in the learning of Taita. Now, I, I want to repeat myself, and I'm sorry for doing it, but I'm not sorry for doing it, because if I was sorry, I wouldn't do it. This doesn't mean that to come to a four-year-old and talk to him about Bitlayesh, being humble. You have to come to a four-year-old talking about being nice. <laughs> you have to come to a four-year-old talking about learning Torah and developing his mind and feeling good about it. And not only a four-year-old, but a 14-year-old, and maybe even a 24-year-old. This isn't untrue. It's just level two or level three or level four. It's not level one. Level one is you have to create a person and teach him humility. And if I, I, I want to give it to you in other words, and. This is true of so many of the core teachings of Hasidus. 
these midas have to be chosen. Nobody can advocate, nobody should tell you, be humble, hey, you're a chassid, be humble. Instead, the person says, I am a chassid, I want to come closer to Hashem. And in coming closer to Hashem, I have to refine myself. And part of that is, as they say in some cultures, getting over myself. Stop being so preoccupied with myself. It's a choice. It's an effort that a person takes on. It's not superimposed. Someone else doesn't sit on your head and teach you humility. Just like someone else cannot sit on your head and teach you Kabbalah sale, discipline. Discipline, which is very hard, to not give in to weakness is very, very difficult. You know, it's, it's easy to lecture on Kabbalah sale. It's, it's, it's about me. I have to choose the discipline of Kabbalah sale. I have to choose the humility and the forgetting about me that is at the core of the humility of a Jew and a chassid that opens me up, not to the elementary level of Torah, but to the higher levels of Torah, or the highest levels of Torah, which are connected to humility. But there's a qualifying factor, and I'm on line 10 now. The question is alternatively, in Cain, if as the Alter Rabbi here proposes, that you want to give the Torah on a tiny little mountain because it's representative of humility, as opposed to on a large, massive mountain, why give the Torah on the mountain altogether? Mount Sinai is after all a mountain. It represents an aloofness, a loftiness. Simply, that it's not as tall, as massive as the other mountains. It almost seems inconsistent. If the Torah represents humility, give it in a pit, give it on the, on the plains, give it in a valley, give it in the Grand Canyon, the lowest point on earth. Why give it on a mountain and a low mountain? And of course the answer is because there's a balance. And what we must understand is that this balance is true even in the big chassid. Even the person of whom humility is a, is a real space, there needs to be this balance. And the Rebbe continues on line 12, and the answer is as follows. Kibem is to be sure. It is true that every person must be extraordinarily humble. Still, at the same time, a person needs to have strength, will. And this strength and will comes along with a certain sense of confidence, of self-assuredness. Now, to many people, it seems inconsistent with humility, but it's not. It's not for various reasons. But if you have only humility, you are what they call a scoop on the a, a doormat. And if you're a doormat, you will be trampled upon. Also, as you find in the that there's a concept of serving Hashem with pride and dignity and self-respect. The, 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 the author of this Maimed had a chassid by the name of Ramot Chalepler, a very big chassid. And he was quite well to do. And he lived in Petersburg, lived in a big city. And to be a chassid in the big city was almost impossible. And the Alter Rebbe, his Rebbe said of him that he's on the level of Benyani, the highest level and so forth. And uh, when he was asked how he maintains that station, he would say, all I do is I remain arrogant. I am a chos of the Alter Rebbe. How can I possibly slip into this kind of uh, misdeed? Alter Rebbe himself testified about the Mardcha Lepler that his service of God is with a gaiva. Now, how could serving Hashem be with gaiva? The answer is because the gaiva is the act. The gaiva is the energy, it's not the person. The person is humble, but there's a strong will, uh, character, that, uh, that, that, that runs the person's engine, that empowers the person. If a person finds himself in a position where they have no sense of self and character and strength, he will never have the courage to begin to serve Hashem. He'll be sheepish. He'll be a lemach. He'll say to himself, Who am I and what is my service worth? You need a balance between Gaiva and Anova. And it's not really a balance or a blend. It's a genuine humbleness. And humbleness means to forget about yourself, to get past yourself. And a strong will, a determination, a strength, a conviction. One must have an elevated heart. Bichuka with a thirst, with a vatimoin and a thirst, so that the person is motivated. Ella. It is only the humility predicts, uh, predominates. So there's got to be a balance between humility and arrogance. Now, uh, let's 
discuss this just a bit. I've told you the story a few times already, I'm sure. That the, the, I'm, I'll save time so I won't go into all the details, within the details, but the short version of the story is that the, a, a young man named Yubit Chakshol said to another young man named Reb Baruch, who was the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Teirer, his father, watch, I want to show you something cute. It was Simchas Teirer, and he goes over to the Gabai, and he says to the Gabai that for the following Hakafa he should call the humblest man in Shtetl, the humblest man in Dabra Misl. So of course the Gabai was not in the mood of practical jokes, but however Rabbi Yitzchak Shol convinced him, the Gabai banged on the bim and said, we're holding the fourth akafa, the first Sefer Teira, the fourth akafa has been given to the humblest man in town. And they came running from every direction, five, six people. And the next morning they met one of these elderly fellows and Rabbi Yitzchak Shol says to this elderly man, you're the third humblest man in town. He says, I'm the third humblest man in town. I am the most humble, I'm supremely humble. He says, yeah, but you arrived at the Sefer Teira first. He says, yeah, because I got bad legs. And the other guys are chutzpahniks. That's not humility. I don't have to tell you that. That's an act. That's a performance. It's the antithesis of humility. It's using the shtick, the shtel of humility, to enhance one's gaiva. It's like the boy who couldn't find the shidduch, because now he's humble too. How do you measure it? It's very difficult to measure. And you know what? It doesn't really matter. Because the only thing that really matters, certainly on these levels, is one person measuring himself against himself. This is not a popularity contest. There's no, you know, humility gauge. I think one of the simplest ways to determine the genuineness of one's humility, or the disingenuineness of one's humility, is simply this. Are you, in, are you philicophobic? Is your presence pushing away others? Or is your presence inviting others? If your presence is pushing away others, you're not humble. If your presence invites others into your space, that, that humility. You know, when one of the Maimorim that was said when our Rebbe got married, the previous Rebbe tells a little story that a Chassid came to the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe that's a Machzedek, and he says, Rebbe, Allah threatened of me. He says, everywhere I walk, people are trampling all over me. So the Rebbe says, if you'll stop spreading yourself around all over, people will not have to trample on you to get from one place to the next. That's not humility. It's, 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 it, it, humility is a, a sense of getting past self. And the sense from getting past self comes from a connection to something bigger. Just think about competition. Why do we compete? And do we like competition? Why do we compete? We compete because somehow we feel that in our competing, in our winning, we are something and somebody. You know, there is Yiddish competition, Kina Seifim Taiba Chochma, which is considered a good thing, but people frequently are not competing over Torah, and certainly not competing over Torah in a Torah way. People compete because they define themselves by others. Could you imagine not needing to compete? Could you imagine not needing to win an argument? Could you imagine not needing to respond to every word, thought, and uh, insult that's sent in your direction? It's not only a greatness, it's a peace, it's a harmony. You know, as we get older, we get wiser. As we get wiser, we start appreciating that it's not about things, it's not about notoriety, it's not about honor, it's, not a, it's about life. Life ultimately is just living. And just living means not needing anybody's approval, just do what you need to do. That's what humility truly is. But along with the humility, you need a will, a ratzon, a will, that drives a person forward, that balances out the humility. And the Maimah's message is that the title was given on a mountain, but a little one. You need to have that will, that urge, that drive. But it's got to be tempered by, by an ability to not be preoccupied with self. I want to share something very in interesting with you. There was a volume of letters published about a year and a half ago, possibly two years ago. It's letters of the previous Rebbe. It's the previous Rebbe's letters, I think it's volume 15 or 16. It's an unusual volume because the entire volume is correspondence between the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe and our Rebbe, the current Lubavitcher Rebbe, and his wife, the Rebbe Sinchayim Mushka. 
because they were away from the previous Rebbe for so long in Berlin and then in Paris. So there was a lot of correspondence, hundreds and hundreds of letters. And from these hundreds and hundreds of letters, several hundred were published. And it's remarkable to read. It's very, very personal, incredibly, incredibly personal. And when you read them, it's, 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 it's a loving father writing to his sweet daughter. It's not a Rebbe writing to a chassid. It's incredibly personal. There are a few places in this volume where in addition to the writings of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, writing to his son-in-law and his daughter, there is some of the correspondence, not a lot, but some of the correspondence of the, of the current Lubavitcher Rebbe to his father-in-law, where he's asking his father-in-law questions. There's not a lot of stuff, but you, you see the incredible humility of the Rebbe in these writings. You know. The previous Rebbe is asking him questions like, what's he learning and how's he doing? He says, well, I'm wasting my time and I... I have no success and I can't find order. I mean, he didn't want to boast to his Rebbe. The previous Rebbe was not only his shved, his father was his Rebbe, and Chassidim don't talk about themselves in the Rebbe's presence. But there's an unusual little note. The, our Rebbe had written a letter to his father and to his father-in-law, sometimes in the middle 30s, maybe early 30s, asking them to explain the Maimei Chazal that a Talmud Chochom needs to have a Shminus Sheba Shminus. The Rebbe was in his 30s. And the Rebbe, at, the, at Bar Mitzvah, his father said he was a Goan Olam. The Rebbe in his 30s was, was a Godel. And he was asking his two influences, his father and his Rebbe, his father-in-law, to explain to him the meaning of the Maimei Chazal, the Talmud Chochom Sheba Shminus Sheba Shminus, that you need to have a little arrogance. And although it's, it's just one word, a few words, it seems to me that the Rebbe is simply saying, I realize that I'm enough of a Dhamm Chochem to need a Shemina, the Shemina, teach me how to do it, you know. So he writes a letter to his own father, and his father writes him a long letter. Remember, his father was in Russia. And he writes a similar letter to the previous Rebbe, and the previous Rebbe doesn't answer. He writes to him, in regard to your question about Shemina, the Shemina, when we'll meet face to face, I'll discuss it with you. Why the previous Rebbe chose to do it this way, I can think of 101 reasons, but I don't know. But I found that little comment, that little, this, this, this whole volume of letters has these tiny little tidbits that are so delicious that the Rebbe realizes that there's got to be a balance. You can't just be humble. There's, there's another side. It's got to be in a proper balance. But what, what's key to this is that humility is not an act. It's who a person is. And it, it's, a, it's a holy station. It's a high level. But it's a peaceful station. It, it makes Yiddishkeit the most wonderful life because you know, nothing is a big deal, essentially. But then there's a third point. Line 16. The idea that the Chazal tell us that humble ones are drawn into God with joy. Now, how do joy and humility get together? And I want you to know that there's extensive writings in Hasidus, about the juxtaposition of joy and humility. Here, just a couple of lines. There are other places in the Lakuta Teda itself where this idea is explored much more uh, extensively. Joy is effervescent. It's overflowing. It's happy. It's spilling over. That doesn't look humble. <laughs> it doesn't look humble at all. It looks self-assured. It looks proud. It looks rich. And you know what? Joy is incredibly humble because only a humble person can allow themselves the freedom to laugh, to be joyous, to not measure every syllable and nuance because they're concerned with appearances. A truly humble person is a truly free person. A truly free person is a truly joyous person. So as ironic as it is, as strange as it seems, humility doesn't mean fakvetched. Humility doesn't mean suppressed. It means beyond self. There's plenty of place for joy in that framework. In fact, this joy is his chaschas like basa nefesh. This is the power and the will that, that complements the humility that was described earlier, that affects that the humility shouldn't be, that one be a doormat, but that the humility come along with a strength of character and a will to do what one needs to do. It must be understood that this joy is nimshach min ha'anavavashifos. It comes from the humility and the lowliness itself. Davka or kumeisha kosta b'seifah shal benyan im seif pedek lamadal. Does the Alter Rebbe quotes the Zayar in Tanya chapter thirty-four, where he describes a tane, 
that would laugh out of his right eye, the right side of his face was laughing, and cry out of his left eye, the left side of his face was crying. Now, that's not so easy to do, huh? But the point is, there was a balance between the joy of his relationship with God and the brokenness in one sense of who they are by themselves. Shemitah, in as much as the body and animal soul are concerned, one is very humble. And at the same time, there is a joy, it comes from the divine soul. The divine spark which is within it, they give it life for Chuli. So there's a balance. It's not a balance where one compromises the next, it's a balance where one is a symptom of the next and one complements the other. The, a truly humble person is a truly free person, and uh, you know you could really add to the scheme a truly trusting person. He trusts his Creator, he trusts God Almighty, and there's something very emancipating, very exciting, very freeing about that. Line 20. Now we read line 21. And the Alta Rebbe concludes, This is the idea of Mount Sinai. That the Gemara says about Mount Sinai, Shiyarda Sina. Why is it called Sinai? For the word sin which means hate. And there are many different interpretations as which hate the Gemara here is referring to when it's saying that Mount Sinai brought hatred into the world. Here he translates, Sina Almides Harois. Mount Sinai brought into the world a hatred to bad character. In other words, it's one thing to behave appropriately and not to behave inappropriately. It's another to feel appropriately and not to feel inappropriately. That's what midas toivis and midas rois means. A good character means to be emotionally in a good place. Bad character means to be emotionally in a bad place. And if you're in an emotionally bad place, it will show itself in your relationship with other people as well. al Darach as the Gemara describes it, there's a constant competition and hatred from the divine soul to the animal soul. And this anger at one's tendency towards arrogance and self-absorption and so forth, it's raising oneself, it's being arrogant over in relationship with one's Yetzirah. But it must be stated that this is in a context. It's not, I'm, you know, I'm arrogant in my hatred for arrogance. I'm humble and I have the will necessary to fight against me in this race. And in conclusion, I, I want to repeat what I think is the most important thing, or, or if I may say it in other words, what I think all of us already understand. My Mori Hasidus, in general, and those my Mori Hasidus that discuss matters of avoida, how to grow as a human being, are serious. Serious means they're not simplistic. He means what he's saying. But as people, this means a journey, a lifetime, and the only place to look is in the mirror.